as I read from that fifth chapter of Micah. Now you are walled around with a wall. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the ruler of Israel upon the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. And therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth. Then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. If the Assyrians come into our land and tread upon our soil, we will raise against them seven shepherds and eight installed as rulers. They shall rule the land of Assyria with the sword, and the land of Nimrod with the drawn sword. And they shall rescue us from the Assyrians if they come into our land or tread within our border. Then the remnant of Jacob, surrounded by many peoples, shall be like dew from the Lord, like showers on the grass, which do not depend upon people or wait for any mortal. And among the nations, the remnant of Jacob, surrounded by many peoples, shall be like a lion among the animals of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through, treads down and tears in pieces with no one to deliver. Your hand shall be lifted up over your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. In that day, says the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and will destroy your chariots. And I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. And I will cut off sorceries from your hand and you shall have no more soothsayers. And I will cut off your images and your pillars from among you and you shall bow down no more to the work of your hands. And I will uproot your sacred poles from among you and destroy your towns. And in anger and wrath, I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. Pray over those words. Lord, we thank you for these words from the prophet. We thank you for both the promise at the beginning of this chapter and the judgment at the end. We thank you for this balance of mercy and judgment, of love and wrath. Lord, I pray that this message would speak to these words, would help them to jump off the page into our own lives. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, as I'm sure you've noticed, Lindsay and Andrew are not with me uh, again this morning. Uh, with the plan being to be at the cafeteria, Lindsay and I had talked about it after the creek flooded, and we decided that it was hard enough for a not yet two-year-old, excuse me, it's hard enough for adults to focus in that cafeteria without asking a not yet two-year-old to do so. We thought that at church, he knows the environment, he knows what he's doing, he knows, he knows the rules, he knows how to behave, and so we bring him Sunday, Sunday in and Sunday out, but at the cafeteria, we thought that was a lot to ask of somebody his age. I've been noticing lately, as I watch him during the days and then when Lindsay gets home from work at night, that Andrew is definitely entering that stage of life where from time to time, he goes what I've termed full toddler. Sometimes he is as mild-mannered and well-behaved and sweet and joyful as you could possibly hope for and just an absolute joy to be around, and sometimes he goes full toddler, where he needs it exactly his way, he needs, he wants what he wants right then and there, and that's all that he wants. And I, as his dad, Lindsay, as his mom, we're having to navigate these waters because there are some times when what Andrew wants is not enough. He needs more than what he wants. Just the other day, he was in the living room and I was on the phone with someone while he was playing. And so I had kind of one eye on him focusing on my phone call. And when I got off the phone, he, hearing that the call was over, came running up to me. Daddy, 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 hoop, hoop, hoop. He has a basketball hoop in our living room that is his pride and joy. And he had a basketball in his hand and he wanted me to play with him. Hoop, 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 daddy. That was what he wanted. I knew exactly what he wanted. He wants that a hundred times a day. Came running up, hoop, hoop, hoop. But as he came up to me, I noticed a couple of other things. One, 
He only had one shoe on now. Somewhere over the course of that phone call, the other shoe had come off. So it was time to do something about that, whether it was put the other shoe on or take the one he still had on off. One shoe was not the way to go. Two, he's got a little bit of a cold right now, and that nose was running about as freely as our creek is right now. So it was time to tend to that as well. And third, something had happened over the course of that phone call that also needed to be tended to. If you were watching me closely, you know what I'm referring to. <laughs> Andrew only wanted one thing in that moment. He just wanted Daddy to play with him. But as his father, I knew that he needed more than just what he wanted. When we come to this chapter in Micah, Micah chapter 5, God's people, God's children know what they want at this point. We talked about it some last week. The nation of Assyria was right at their gates, right at the gates of Jerusalem, trying to lay siege to the holy city, trying to get in, trying to conquer this people. What God's people wanted, what God's children desired, was an end to this, an end to the oppression that was being put upon them, an end to the constant insecurity that they were facing day in and day out. And more than that, more than just an end to the bad, they wanted some good for the first time in what seemed like forever. They wanted to be powerful again. They wanted to be wealthy again. They wanted to be victorious again. For too long, nations and empires like Assyria had been using God's people, Israel and Judah, like a bug to be stomped upon. And they were tired of it. They knew what they wanted from God. They wanted God to step up and put an end to these enemies. But as we've read in these first four chapters, Judah needed more than just that. They needed far more than that. They needed an end to the idolatry that they'd been practicing. They needed leaders who would stand up for what God wanted instead of just what they wanted. They needed a newfound commitment to justice in their land. To sum it all up, what they needed was repentance. They needed to turn from what they were doing back to what God had called them to do. So we come to Micah chapter 5 here, and that's our situation. And what we get is a series of promises to the people. A lot of judgment in the first three chapters, a little bit of mercy in chapter 4, and now we get some promises to God's people. Promises for then, but with a word for us today. That the Father does not stop at giving his children what they want. Sometimes he also gives them what they need. So verse 1 is where we get this picture of Assyria ready to lay waste to God's people. They'd already done it once before, you've got to understand. Only a generation before that, they'd gone into the northern kingdom of Israel to those ten tribes and had laid siege to Samaria and had even carried off some of God's people into exile. They had, as verse 1 talks about, humiliated Israel's king, and now they were about to do the same thing to Judah's. This empire of Assyria, they were no longer content to just intimidate God's people now. They wanted to out and out conquer them. And in the face of this, Micah initially didn't bring good news. First three chapters, as I said, was a lot of judgment, a lot of announcements about how Judah was being punished for its evil and how it would eventually fall. But now Micah tempers that judgment with these, these promises. After the judgment comes mercy. And so echoing Isaiah, we get in these first few verses a familiar promise, one that we read just about every Christmas time, of a ruler to come, a David-like figure from Bethlehem, one who would lead like a shepherd, one who would take care of God's people. These things that sound a lot like the good old days of King David. And God promises that he will send such a figure to bring peace. The point that we get 
from these first few verses is that in their time of distress, God promises that he will save his children. There's a story just a few months ago about a man named Brad Lewis. And Brad and his sons were playing in their beach house, playing upstairs, had some little Nerf guns, and they were running around playing Nerf guns with one another. And as Nerf bullets are, tend to do, one of them got away from them, went out the back door upstairs and off of the balcony. Brad's eight-year-old son, Oscar, seeing where it had gone, took off chasing after it, leaned over the balcony to see if there was any way to get to it, and went tumbling off the balcony 15 feet up in the air. Brad, thinking fast, grabbed his son and tumbled right off with him. And in that 15 feet from the top to the concrete below, Brad grabbed his son, clutched him close, turned his back, and absorbed the entire impact of the fall. Suffered broken vertebrae, broken bones in his neck. Severe, severe injuries. His son escaped with nothing but a concussion. Media got word of this. It's a good human interest story of a father saving his son. He was asking Brad what was going through his head in those just second and a half of falling. What he was thinking that prompted him to do this. And Brad said... I've got to tell you, I think any father would have done the same thing. When I think about these words from Micah, it occurs to me that our Heavenly Father did the same thing. Taking wounds that were meant for us upon himself. And the reason for this is very simple. Because God saves his children. Every Sunday... We sing about that. We worship God not only as Lord, not only as Master, not only as Creator, but as Savior. We praise the fact that God saves His children. What Micah promised we have seen fulfilled in Jesus. That God sent a Messiah, God sent a Savior, that from our sins we might be rescued. We worship him for that today because God saves his children. Of course, salvation is not the only thing that's promised in this passage. And that becomes really obvious when you get to verses 10 through 15. If you were listening closely when I was reading or you were following along in your own Bible, you probably detected a pretty severe shift in tone when we got to that verse. Up to that point, it had been a lot of talk about salvation, about God saving his people rescuing them from the Assyrians, sending someone as a source of salvation. And then in 10 through 15, let me just give you a taste once again. In that day, says the Lord, I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots. I will cut off the cities of your land, throw down all your stronghold. And it goes on and on and on like that, all the way through verse 15. From this message that the Lord God will trample the enemies of his children to suddenly something much different. Now, I think I can probably guess what Judah wanted to hear from God. What they wanted to hear when this Messiah came was, on that day, I will fill your treasury with gold. On that day when Messiah comes, the land will once again flow with milk and honey. On that day, the throne will be restored. On that day, Israel will reign supreme. On that day, on that day, on that day. What he says instead is, on that day, I will take from you every source of false security you have. The things in which you have trusted instead of me, gone. Gone. The idols which you have worshipped instead of me, gone. The false promises in which you have invested your lives, no more. When that day comes, God says, you will rely on me and me alone. So if you've been wondering how the 
hammer of judgment from chapters 1 through 3 connects to the promises of chapters 4 through 7? Here's your answer. Not only does God save his children, he also sanctifies his children. Remember whenever I was a child, there were certain obligations, certain responsibilities, certain appointments that I would try to weasel out of. When I found out that a dentist appointment was going to be happening soon, it was not unusual for me to find another commitment that was that day to where, oh, dentist point will just have to be rescheduled for a few weeks until I can figure out how to weasel out of it again. Whenever there was a school day where I didn't particularly want to go very much, I just wasn't feeling all that good all of a sudden. Just these times would come where I had a responsibility, I had somewhere I needed to be, and as a child, immature, I'd look for a way out of it. I'd look for a way to get to what I wanted instead of what I needed. But every parent in this room can tell you that your job as a parent is not just to give your kid what they want. As I said, I'm learning that a little bit more every day. Your job is not always to keep your child happy. A parent's job is to keep your child healthy, even when it's sometimes at the expense of their happiness. The same goes, I think, for our Heavenly Father. Hear me when I say this. Our God is far less concerned about your happiness than he is your holiness. Let me say that again. Our God is far less concerned about your happiness than your holiness. Because I think the people of Judah would tell you, you can be pretty happy and pretty sinful at the same time. You can fill your lives with the kinds of false security and false promises and idols that were captivating them back in these days. And for a while, at least, you can be pretty happy with your situation. But you can't do so and still be following God. God cares far more for our holiness than our happiness. He's far more concerned that we strive toward his image than the false images that we conjure up for ourselves. There's one more thing I notice here. In saving his children and in sanctifying his children... God does one more thing. He surprises his children. Because he promises this Messiah, this, this king to come. But the description he gives isn't exactly like what you might expect. For one thing, he says that this ruler to come will come from the little village of Bethlehem. If you were mapping it out back in that day, you'd probably want them to come from Jerusalem. That's the holy city. That's, that's where God is. Bethlehem. We already got a king from there way back when. What's a little place like Bethlehem doing getting a king? He'll lead like a shepherd. Well, if Assyria's right at the gates, I'm not looking for a shepherd. I'm looking for a warrior. I don't want somebody with a rod and a staff. I'm looking for somebody with a sword and a shield. But God says he'll lead like a shepherd. And there's this little bit in verse 5. So much you almost probably didn't notice it. He shall be the one of peace. I don't think Judah was looking for that in that moment. I don't think they were looking for peace so much. I think they were looking for someone to take on their enemies. Someone who would do what none of their prior kings had been able to do. Verse 7 goes on to say that this one to come would depend solely on God, even when being surrounded by enemies. And verse 10 through 15 talk about how God won't just smash sin and wickedness outside of Judah's borders. 
but will also smash the sin and wickedness within. The promise of salvation is nice. That's something you could wrap your arms around. But there's little surprises in there that weren't quite what the people were looking for. We can guess what Judah wanted from God, but God surprises his children then and today. There's a video that went viral a couple of years ago. A couple of parents who gathered their kids around the kitchen table, and it was apparent from the first few seconds of the video that they were about to go on a trip. This was the last breakfast. There were suitcases piled in the corner. They were getting ready to go on a trip, and the parents sat them down and said, there's something we need to tell y'all about our trip. We're not actually going to grandma's house. Because you, the YouTube viewer, see at the top, parents surprise kids with trip to Disney, you know where it's going, and you're just waiting for the reaction now when you watch this video. It's not what you think it would be. Because the parents say, we're not going to grandma's house after all. And the little girl at the head of the table starts sobbing. Bursts into tears. Just horribly disappointed by this news. She was all set, all excited to go to grandma's house and being told that that's not where they're going before they can get the next half of the announcement out. She just can't take it. Tears streaming down her face and her parents try to console her, try to tell her, no, 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 it's good, it's good, it's good. We're going to, we're, we're going to go into Disney World and you get to see Mickey and Minnie and they're trying to give it, the girl can't hear it. I just want to go to grandma's. That's her, that's her concern. She's sobbing so hard she misses the good news. We can identify with that little girl, I think. Because sometimes we are so fixated on what we want, what we expect from God, that we miss out on his far greater plan. We're so convinced that we know where he's leading us, that the minute a detour happens, we break down. That the minute he does something we weren't expecting, we just can't take the surprise. There's a reminder for us here that we ought to approach God with a spirit of humility, trusting that his ways are greater than our own. Because the truth is, sometimes God surprises us. Never was the surprise greater than when God fulfilled the promise found here in Micah chapter 5. The day when he sent that Messiah from Bethlehem of Ephrathah. There's a lot of surprise in the way God fulfilled his promise. That the birth didn't come in a palace, but a manger. With no cast of thousands to greet the birth of the ruler, just some shepherds. Later on, a year down the road, some wise men. This Messiah was a surprise because he was accompanied throughout his life not by a palace guard, but a motley crew of fishermen and tax collectors and just general ruffians. This was a Messiah who associated not with princes but prostitutes, not with sultans but Samaritans, not with leaders, but with lepers. Not with warriors, but with the weak. This was a Messiah who, when he came into his glory, made his triumphal entry not on a royal steed, but on a humble donkey. This was a Messiah who, when he came into his glory, wasn't embraced, but rejected. Betrayed by one of his own, disowned by another, left to his fate by all. This was a Messiah who was not blessed by the chief priests of Israel, but condemned by them. When he marched to glory, he was met not with cheers, but with jeers. He wasn't showered in praise, he was showered in spit. He was covered in his own blood, not the blood of his enemies. 
And when they put the crown on his head, it wasn't a crown of gold. It was a crown of thorns. When the time finally came for him to come into his glory, he said, it is finished. And when he said that, it wasn't his enemies that died. It was him. This Messiah was a big surprise. But never more so than when just a few days later, that stone rolled away from the tomb. Our God was not done surprising his children. The resurrection was the greatest surprise of all. Jesus gave us everything that the prophet promises here. Jesus saves. Jesus sanctifies. And Jesus surprises. For us today, for us for whom these prophecies are ancient words, long fulfilled. It's worth remembering today that Jesus saves, that Jesus sanctifies, that Jesus surprises. That when this world feels like too much to handle, we serve a risen Savior. That when our own lives feel like too much to handle, we serve a Lord who sanctifies who cleanses us of our unrighteousness and points us to a better way. That we serve a God who does the miraculous, the unexpected, does what we could never imagine doing ourselves. The truth is that in Christ, God gave us far more than just what we wanted. Our God gave us exactly who we needed. So let's pray.